Okay, we are going to get started, and I would like to welcome everybody to our monthly webinar series. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of NAAAE, and I'm so thrilled you could all join us. Um, many of you know Megan Bang. I could see through all the chats that some of you are really excited to have a chance to hear her talk. She is a developmental psychologist and learning scientist focused on the study of learning and human development in and across everyday contexts. She looks at designing and building science learning environments from indigenous philosophies and studying child, family, and teacher learning and practice in novel environments. She's a board member of the, she's a member of the Board of Science Education of the National Academy of Sciences. She's won numerous early career awards from leading scholarly associations. And prior to joining the School of Education and Social Policy, at Northwestern University. She worked as an associate professor of education at the University of Washington. She also has experience teaching high school students. She studied STEAM, which is STEM plus the arts, learning among K through 12 indigenous youth and has examined differences among rural Native American, urban Native American and urban non-Native American preschoolers in their approaches to play with the forest diorama. Her work has two critical components. The first is working at the immediate and practical levels of improving teachers and learning with indigenous youth and communities with a primary focus on science education. And the second area is to conduct transformative research that deepens understanding of the relationships between culture and cognition in and across learning settings. She is also working on a number of exciting pro projects, including designing a hybrid course that brings together Northwestern students with young people and community members outside the university to investigate issues of social justice within the education system. We are so excited to have Megan with us today, and I know we are all going to learn a ton from her work and really excited about what she is helping to bring to our field. So uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm glad to be here. I always find webinars both fun to do, but also so strange. I like talking to avoid pretending that I can see all of your lovely faces. Um, but I thought I wanted to start by um, kind of introducing myself and giving a little bit of a context of um, a little bit more context. Um, so um, so my name is Megan, um, and I saw a few questions um, about kind of who I am and how I got to do this work. Um, and I will start by just saying that um, I'm Ojibwe on my mom's side and um, uh, second generation Italian immigrant from uh, on my dad's side from New York. Um, I grew up with my mom. Um, but I wanted to just give a little bit of sense so that at least I know that you all are having some image of who I am um, besides sort of the professional context. And I guess I'll say this is that um, I come to this work as someone who's been um, and whose family and community has been deeply impacted by formal education. Um, I have a grandfather. Um, I have a mother-in-law and a father-in-law and great comrades who all went through boarding school. Um, and I got into the work of doing educational res research and trying to improve education um, because I have a fundamental perspective that formal education has been a tool of colonialism that has harmed Native communities. And I like to imagine the possibility that education could be a source of healing um, that contributes to our collective thriving. Um, and so I come to this work with that kind of orientation. And this picture is um, that I'm showing you are pictures of um, my own grandparents and family. Um, as well as, um, this is like my claimed, I get nervous doing these things. And so this, this top picture of us in a canoe is, that's me with my baby on my back. And I am taking um, uh, grandma wild ricing for the first time who went to boarding school. Um, and so I often think about how is it that we are creating educational contexts that transform lives and communities toward healthful, thriving lives. Um, I also come as a mom of eight and an auntie to very many, um, but I also come to this work um, in, in that capacity. So this is me and my crazy bunch. Um, and I and I like to start here partly because I'm now a full professor and usually people who give professional talks don't tell you much about their families. Um, and I think it's really important that we create the context in which people can bring their full human selves. Um, that and they're cute. So I like people to know, my, <laughs> know that. Um, 
And then I just want to say a few things. Um, I come to this work from a whole range of kind of community-based experiences. Um, I was I started out as a preschool teacher. I have taught GED. I have taught in schools for recently released juvenile offenders. Um, I obviously teach teachers now and school leaders, um, but I also have worked in museums. And part of why I say all that is that I kind of come um, to this work and thinking about um, how is it we really understand what culture is, how it impacts learning and thriving, and what does it mean for us to really understand the context of education in that way. Um, so I'm happy to answer other questions, but I, it's a good place for me to start. And I want to tell you a little bit about my goals today is I really wanted to open up some theoretical principles, some key framing ideas and research that I hope that people um, leave here dissatisfied with my answers and wanting to know more. So you should know that my expectation is not that I've given you perfect definitions, but that hopefully I will spark thinking then you'll be interested in continuing to learn no more. Um, I'm going to share some ideas about the design of learning environments. I'm a person that um, thinks about teacher practice. I think about the design of learning and I'll tell you more about why. Um, and I'm going to talk about that for around native youth specifically today. But I wanna say this is that um, I think it's really important um, for me as an educator, I am there is a difference between educating about native people and education for native people. Um, and you can do both of those all of the time. What I often get is questions about uh, education about Native people, um, and there's a particular way that that gets positioned to answer. Um, and so today you're going to hear me talk a little bit about environmental education and science education that is really um, a, about how am I thinking about doing this with Native youth in communities and communities and families. And so I'll ask you to really think about how, how if the assumption is always this is also relevant to non-Native youth families and communities too. I'm going to try to get some into some specifics around pedagogical practices, and then I'm hoping there's enough time I'm going to answer some questions as they come in. Um, I wanted to say I know a lot of you put questions forward. Um, I um, am hoping that a lot of them will be answered. Um, some of them may not be, and we've already started talking about how we might have some follow-up around specific resource questions and those sorts of things post the webinar. Um, so that's my goals for today. Um, and so I'm going to dive in and sort of tell you that I come to this work that ultimately I think um, one of the grand challenges of 21st century education is how do we develop teaching and learning that cultivates just sustainable and culturally thriving communities. Um, and part of what that means is that I think deeply about how identity, learning, and development are all cultural processes. There's nothing, there is no neutrality in uh, teaching and learning, and we know that as a human phenomena. Um, that, that all learning is cultural, um, but we don't necessarily know that in the design of teaching and learning. Um, the other thing is, is that I come to this thinking about um, one of the demands of the 21st century is that there's an increased ability to reason about socio-ecological issues and systems. Um, and for me, at the, at the core of this work, is that there is a need to uphold, redesign, and imagine a new ethical and healthful what I call nature culture relations. That is the constructions of relations between human peoples and, and the rest of the natural world. Um, just to say human beings have been doing this forever across cultures in different kinds of ways always. Um, but I'm also gonna bring that I'm orienting to this in a North American context and a US context in particular um, and thinking about the ways that power and historicity have shaped the fundamental kind of relations between um, humans and the natural world in, in, our, in our context. Um, and ultimately, um, just to say this is, again, this is a human phenomenon. Human beings have done this always. Um, and we can think about how we teach history about people or the development of different, um, different societies. Um, and it is an ongoing thing. Um, and so hopefully you all are seeing kind of my deliberate loop about current phenomena happening in the world. Um, and I think that a lot of what my work is about is understanding how we are not yet um, at the place that I think we need to be um, in educating young people about the world um, that that we're all hoping they'll be able to navigate and show leadership in. Um, so that's kind of the grand challenge and, and I'm gonna keep diving into like, what does it mean to take this grand challenge up? Um, so and Megan, this is Judy. Would you like to see the poll to see who's on the call? 
Because yep, that would be great. Yeah, Kristen can show that and we can take just a break and you can see where people are coming from. So most in non-formal settings, but not all. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much. So I want to start by just saying that one of the things that I think that um, has been a fallacy of Western science um, and potentially education is that somehow knowledge and knowing isn't powered or uh, culturally specific. And I just want to start by saying, like, uh, my fundamental orientation is that culture, history, and power, and power are always interacting in knowledge and knowing. Um, and on the left side of the screen, I'd like to point out that if we think about the edges of kind of botany and plant science right now, um, the idea that plants have communicative capacity is now the edge of science. Um, and just 20 years ago, this was quack science by the dominant sort of by the professional scientific world. However, the idea is that plants have personhood that have agency um, is uh, a really old indigenous idea <laughs> and way of being. And so part of the reason I like to start here with making sure people recognize that the deep kind of ways that I mean culture, history, and power are always interacting is that indigenous peoples, we've always had ways of knowing and con like constructions of knowledge about the natural world. Um, and part of what has happened over years of colonialism um, is the invisibility and erasure of our ways of knowing as being complex systems of knowing. Um, and I start here because I think that it's really important as educators that we realize that there isn't settled scientific knowledge, whether it's Western science or indigenous science, that it's a growing body of knowledge. Um, and I, and I often start here just to say, like, we have to remember that um, the Western world is changing what it knows all the time. Um, and indigenous people continue to learn and refine our own knowledge systems as well. I wanna say one thing about that. Um, all indigenous knowledge systems are not the same. One of the things that you're gonna hear me, you're gonna hear me use those terms, um, but I wanna be clear about this, is that you, everyone on this call should be careful um, about assumptions around when you start to interact with specific communities um, and know that there are always diversities of knowing um, amongst different tribal nations and indigenous nations across the globe. Um, and so, so I'll keep saying those things and try to give some nuance, but I, but I do wanna say um, I'm talking in some generalities um, and so folks should not make assumptions um, that some ideas hold true across all native peoples. Okay, um, so, so part of the orienting for me is that scientific knowledge, Western scientific knowledge is always evolving, but I have two kinds of stances that I'm always trying to think through and work with educators, both non-native educators as well as native educators around what does it mean to engage in decolonial and anti-racist education? And what does it mean to engage in a kind of indigenous resurgence education? And part of what I wanna say is, um, for me, there, there is an important difference in understanding that decolonial and anti-racist education um, is fundamentally about refusing indigenous erasure and deficit models through what people call presencing native peoples. There are all kinds of ways that indigenous erasure exists in our systems. I'm gonna keep saying more about this, but or also deficit and sort of racist um, narratives of native people. Um, and there's a... Uh, um, a uh, specific reference here to a paper called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. I noticed some questions about wanting to know more about decolonization. I highly recommend people read this piece. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about indigenous erasure um, in a couple of slides about some of the ways that plays out in schools. For me though, one of the things that this means is really thinking about the impacts of coloniality on all of our thinking and how it is a framed um, and made normative um, some deep ideas that have everything to do um, with, with the erasure and ongoing genocide of indigenous people, such that things like um, settler ways can become normative and assumed. Um, and I'll say more about that, but um, it really is about a, a routine process of thinking about how coloniality shapes the ways that we think, the ways that we teach, the kinds of assumptions we make about possible futures. Um, but it's a routine question. Um, and just to say, 
I think about this multiple times a day for myself. I ask these questions in large groups of native teachers that this is a kind of routine practice that we do when we think about the fact that we're all living in a deeply colonial and deeply racist society. Um, so that's that part. I think for me, the other part of this um, comes a, a bit from both being an educator of young children and raising children, um, but this idea of indigenous resurgence. And part of the reason is, is that um, I, I worry about us only starting from the negative or the critical place. And I wanna think about um, how is it that we're always cultivating kind of what people call indigenous resurgence or the idea of what, what do you do differently if you assume the healthy thriving of indigenous communities not, not bound by coloniality? Um, and so I'm always thinking about that. And part of that is that assumption around not seeing a five-year-old child as um, damaged. Um, and so, so really holding like these two pieces um, and ways of thinking about things always is a part of the work that I do. I'm gonna have to hurry up or else I'm gonna end up talking to you for a really long time. Um, I do want to say the other reason this is important is that how we construct these things shapes socio-political possibilities and decision making. And again, I'm just putting out here to say that things like personhood of plants or more than humans um, is a newer idea to the West and something that has been in a lot of indigenous communities anyway for a long time. And we can see sort of the rights of nature as an emerging legal framework globally that is recognizing um, personhood in a different sort of way. Um, at the same time, we can still see things like the Trans Mountain Pipeline um, where humans are still making decisions that they know it's bad for land and they know decisions are bad for indigenous cultures and communities but we make decisions that way anyway. Um, and, and just to make visible the kinds of narratives um, and constructions of both human worlds and the natural world that we all swim in um, in our daily lives. Part of it for me is to recognize the relationship between how we structure learning environments and these larger socio-political dynamics. And my point of this right here is to demonstrate that in my work, I think a lot about how our pedagogies and the ways that we position children to learn about the environment, about land and waters, and about human, other human communities and different kinds of ways, um, actually leads to, or may, at, at, at best, fails to prevent things like Standing Rock. Um, even, even when we have cheery little girls looking through microscopes, there is a profound relationship um, between the kind of dispossession of relationships to land and waters that happens in much of um, uh, education about lands and waters, whether it's science education, environmental education, or place-based education, there are some deep principles. Um, and just to say, uh, for me, a lot of my work is understanding how when we, in teaching and learning, when we construct relationships between humans and the natural world, we often are setting the foundations for um, what I, I think a lot about as human entitlement and practices of extraction. Um, and so for me, a lot of the learning environment work that I do is thinking about how do we transform those fundamental kind of practices and sensibilities, whether we're teaching um, with native kids or not. Um, so uh, I think it's important for us all to think about that because I think that's the pervasive kind of ethical positioning we've been after. But with native people in particular, one of the things that happens is that um, we have an education system in the US anyway, that has been cultivating the systemic eraser and invisibility of native people. Um, and it has led to a series of things, both for native um, learners as well as non-native folks. So this is some work from Sarah Shear um, that 87%, so, 50% 50, 50 of the United States actually has standards that require teaching about indigenous people. 87% of those standards dictate the teaching of indigenous peoples in a pre-1900 US history, a uh, pre-1900 context, which, um, and emphasize what Sarah has called a conquest narrative. So that means we are systematically teaching the general public and multiple generations of people now to see native people as past and, and conquered. 
Okay, um, and part of that means that it sets up all kinds of invisibility and frankly, deeply educated stereotypes about native people. Um, and it also leads to how it is easier to make uh, ongoing decisions um, that hurt native communities um, if you've mass educated the public to think that we're not here. Um, the thing that also is really important about this, not only is this around representation of native people, but it perpetuates a narrative that we don't have robust knowledge systems. Uh, so when people do engage, um, we get, frankly, kind of really misinformed understandings um, about Native people, and they become really reductive. So there's all kinds of layerings of this. Um, there is really little recognition of the Native diaspora um, that is in the general public, and there's lots of dynamics about that, um, both the diversity of Native nations, even within the U.S. context, most people have no idea I think we're at 573 federally recognized nations, another 200 and something state recognized nations, and anywhere between 50 and 80 that are currently struggling for recognition. Um, and on top of that, we have very dense urban communities um, that are both longstanding as well as um, products of termination and relocation. The point is, is that people have very little idea about the complexity um, of native communities in the United States. Um, and this leads to a series of what people have called kind of a denial of our very presence or right to exist. And what is manifested in, as I'm partly wanting to make sure people know this so that as you move forward and you think about why you're doing this work and how you're thinking about this is that we know that um, Native young people um, have some of the highest suicide rates uh, of any group in the world. Um, in particular contexts. And so there's been a lot of really interesting work um, with um, Chandler and Lalonde in particular that says when native communities have a series of factors like self-governance, land claims, control of their own education, control of their health systems, when they have lots of cultural facilities and language, um, when they have their own police forces, um, the suicide rate goes down to nothing. So the point is, is when we have self-determination, we have healthy nations. Um, and when we don't, we see that we see continually that there are ongoing struggles. Um, so all of this is to lead up to say some of this language we can ignore. All of this is to lead up to say that all teaching and learning is always political and it always requires ethical deliberations and decisions. And so for me, a lot of my work is to understand this larger context and then think about how is our learning environments um, making decisions around a lot of things. And for Native communities, the right to make decisions about teaching and learning was deliberately disrupted as a colonial tool. Um, and so I think a lot about the design of learning environments as an act of um, educational self-determination, but also nationhood in a ton of ways. And so things like what should students be learning? Why should they learn it? How should they learn it? Where should they learn it? Who should teach it? Um, and what are the narratives about who students should be and become um, are all decisions that go into our learning environments and are that live in those places, whether we design or choose them or not. Um, and a lot of these things just live below the surface many times. So I say that to say to give a kind of bigger like what are we talking about when we design learning environments or we enact learning environments. And to the right, there's a kind of, there's a, one of my early studies was to say, so this is pretty complicated stuff. Do native kids know this? And this was a study with third and fourth graders. And we wanted to know if they, how they were orienting and recognizing, do they think their science teachers and their community elders know the same things, agree about things? And it was a really simple cognitive test um, that we gave kids, they had to sort pictures. And essentially what you can see here on the right, this is a statistical difference. Kids as young as third or fourth grade know that their science teachers reason about what is alive and what has personhood in the world very differently than elders in their community. And why that matters, it means be, by the time kids are in third or fourth grade, they can articulate that there are different knowledge systems that learning environments force them to navigate. So often I get, when I train pre-service teachers, they'll say, why does this matter? And I'll say, because you have a choice about whether you're going to leave kids alone to navigate that or whether you're gonna help them do that successfully in a way that helps them thrive, because they're doing it, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. So that kind of gives me um, some 
big kinds of things. And I wanted to just give you a couple of things to step back with. And I think you all will get these slides. Um, so, so I hope that one of the things you're taking from this kind of um, large scale, this, lar this broad look is that um, as you engage in environmental education, thinking about how you're explicitly designing for dimensions of race, culture, and power in your learning environments is a kind of reflective practice you should be doing. Um, and I think a lot of what I'm asking people to think about is what kinds of stories and narratives of land and water are you teaching? Um, how are indigenous peoples and expertise and our expertise, um, sorry, there's a typo, represented or narrated in your work or in your learning environments? Um, and we'll keep talking about that. I'm going to show you ways that I do that and continue to think about that. I also want to be really specific. I saw a series of questions um, about things you should do. Um, and one thing that you should definitely do is educate yourself and your networks about settler colonialism. If you don't know what that word is or what that means, definitely lots of resources to think about. Um, and think about how you're showing commitment to upholding tribal sovereignty. Um, so it's one way to just think about, like, how am I, how am I walking in the world doing that? Um, and then I think that big one that I'm going to continue to say that luckily there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, so there isn't one right way. But how are you refusing kind of indigenous sort of visibility and erasure by engaging and making meaningfully indigenous people, what people call indigenous presence? Um, and there's a couple of things that I would just say. Um, you're all are environmental educators or care about that, which means that you're talking about lands and place all the time. And so always recognizing whose territories you're on and doing it in a meaningful way. There's a really beautiful kind of um, recommendation that came from a group of indigenous scholars that is at the American Education Research Association. Um, but I also think it means recognizing, are you historicizing native people? So I know that some of you are already doing this and part of what happens that we see a lot is that we refer to native people as past in lots and lots of ways or our knowledges as only of the past and not as continually developing over time. Um, and so really think about your historic tribe narratives. And then the last one is just form partnerships with tribal communities. And I'm gonna say more about that in a, in a couple of minutes, but hopefully that's enough to kind of say like, there are high level things that you can do and take and continue to think about. Um, so let's say, by chance that it's possible for all of us to be good in those dimensions, which by the way, I don't actually think that, but let's just say that you do a lot of work as an adult, as an educator. Um, part of what I wanna get at is it partly doesn't, it's not enough to be doing this for as adults. You also have to think about the many worlds that learners are experiencing and navigating in the world. And I'm gonna do this fast because I'm talking too long already to get to the meat of things that I wanna talk about. But I do this a lot. This is based on a kind of imagine a scientist. And I'm just gonna fly through this part. I often ask people to imagine a scientist. Do things like three words that describe what does a scientist do. And then I'll show them this picture. And then I'll ask them to say, when you imagine the scientist, what's the closest image that you imagined in your mind? And what we know from about 60 years of studies now is that most people imagine a white guy in a lab coat with a microscope or a beaker of some kind doing something like chemistry. And that um, this is actually increasing, increasingly true globally. Um, there's some studies that have been done in India as well as China that um, kids produce this image. Um, and so part of the point is, is that children come in with narratives about science and land no matter what. And as educators, it's part of our job to think about what they're bringing with them, both as kind of their culture and ways of being, but also the kind of dominant narratives about things. Um, and I often think uh, this is an important thing, I'm not, um, is that part of the creation of learning environments is again about helping kids navigate this. Um, and so when we're doing things like engaging in environmental education, there are all kinds of what people call disciplinary identities. And that we know by the start of middle school, kids have shaped these, um, and have shaped these in ways that are often defined by Western ways of knowing whiteness and maleness. Um, and so whether or not we think when we're teaching about land or some beautiful bird or groups of birds or the role of plant life, all of these uh, human identities and dimensions are also at play in those learning environments. And so I'm gonna skip that. Part of what I often think about is what would it take for people to also imagine these kinds of images 
um, when we imagined or as we imagined as part of science. And these are all kind of everyday routine practices where deep knowledge and observations um, about the natural world and people's relationship to it have been formed in indigenous communities. Um, and just to say, over 20 years, I've continued to do work to see where kids are at. It's not hard to get kids to think differently about these things. Um, actually, it's that there are very few learning environments that prioritize these kinds of shifts as key to what kids need to learn about. So I'm going to show you a specific learning environment, um, one that there's versions of this that I've been involving for a really long time. Um, and um, I'm gonna say a couple of things about it. I'm really interested in how we are helping to prepare kids um, to lead um, and to think about what it means to live um, in changing uh, lands and waters. Um, sometimes people think about that as climate education. It's fine. Um, but the elders that I work with often say, are, uh, we've always had changing lands and waters and climate change is a white word. Um, and it, it is a little bit of a panic word in a way that doesn't understand the nidamicism of land. Um, so this project has been ongoing for about eight years and there are many iterations of it. Um, but I want to acknowledge that I've been up to this work where I engage in something that we call co-design. Um, and that means that I engage a series of community partners to actually develop learning environments as well as implement them, as well as conduct the research on them. Um, but I did know that there were a series of questions that people had um, around how do they partner with indigenous communities when you signed up. And I wanna encourage everyone to first own why you wanna be in, in partnership with native peoples and are you really committed? Um, as someone who ran a community organization for 15 years, I had lots and lots of people that wanted to partner with us, but really they didn't, they just wanted us to be a placeholder. Um, and um, it felt like uh, what we often see happen where um, people want uh, native communities to contribute, but contribute on someone else's terms. Um, and so you really have to think about what, what relationship am I forming? Am I perpetuating a kind of historical interaction? Um, or am I trying to reimagine relations between native communities and non-native communities in the context we're in? Um, do your homework first. I, you shouldn't be asking native communities to be your teacher that you never had. Um, and so uh, most of us, there are as many beautiful resources and books and things um, that you can at least try um, to learn about before you try to form partnerships. So do your homework. Um, even if you get it wrong, uh, in my experience, I think lots of Native people appreciate someone trying and, and being able to earnestly try um, rather than being asked to be uh, the teacher they never had. Um, the other thing is to go and form a relationship before you ask for something. So that means go and be in community, be present, get to know people before you pitch a project um, and make sure that the work that you're wanting to do actually is something like that is reciprocal. That is the kind of thing that would benefit both native communities and native people and other people. Um, Learn how to ask appropriately. Um, I get a lot of people demanding that they need a native expert on something in order to do it well and um, that uh, I should make time. I should do what they need. Um, and I just would really encourage people to realize that that is probably not the best way uh, to transform historically powered relations. Um, and I think you should do it formally. Um, for my work, just to say, I go and present to tribal councils. I spend time with elders. Um, I have ways that I'm presenting to public communities all of the time, but we also form official memorandums of partnerships. Um, and um, I think those things are really, really important. Um, it's also the way that you can uphold tribal sovereignty. Um, I think the other thing is, is that oftentimes people want to start projects and their goals are not the same. And so be prepared to shift your goals um, the more that you can, as much as you can. And then the last thing I'll just say as a kind of tip about this is to be patient. If you're trying to partner over two years, um, two years is probably not long enough to do the kind of transformative work. And so you may, after, you may have to be patient and take the time to develop relations and realize that um, good relations are, means that you're making things like lifetime commitments in partnerships. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna tell you that what I'm up to is I call it land and water-based science education. Um, and part of it is because I'm after actually making sure all education is what some people call placed. Um, but it is also the kind of thing that indigenous scholars have been saying for a long time. We often, I started out here saying that we often uh, teach about native people 
instead of teach in ways that uh, contribute to our thriving. And one of my favorite quotes from Vine Deloria, it's sort of my, one of my intellectual heroes is that he talks about that we shouldn't, uh, we should be creating the conditions under which our knowledge systems and ways of knowing develop. That is um, not trying to teach about ourselves, but actually provide the context in which our knowledge continues to grow and kids thrive. Um, and I kind of say that we have a kind of anthropological pedagogical hangover in lots of ways. We teach about things. We don't necessarily create conditions for learning and knowing uh, in ways that we want to. And the other thing is, is that I think that um, we have to understand that place teaches implicitly um, no matter what we're doing. Um, and I'm sure that this is true for most people on the call, uh, learning, out in the middle of a title pool here is quite different than inside a building looking at an image. Um, and I just take that idea deeply seriously and study actually differences in human thinking across these contexts. Um, and I'm gonna share today this, um, I'm not gonna say actually much more about this. I'm gonna share this project to you with you today where we've been doing these deep inquiries um, into three places. One is at Discovery Park. This is a project that's specifically in Seattle. I do this in four other for their communities right now. This one is in Seattle where we were studying a place called Mima Mounds, a place called Karkeek Park that has a salmon restoration run in Seattle um, and Discovery Park where um, the Seattle urban native community has a longstanding community center called Daybreak Star. Um, and we've been running these summer programs uh, for almost a decade um, around in these different places. Um, and part of what we've been doing is we call this place designing. Um, so I have emphasized a couple times now how you are designing matters. Um, most people sit in rooms and decide learning objectives and then write out lesson plans and materials that way. Um, for us, we spend a lot of time actually being in the places and imagining what kinds of relations, what kinds of noticing, what, what do we hope that um, kids would know would wonder about, would ask questions about in these different locations? What stories should they know? Um, and we use that actually so that we're trying to always center land. Um, and in this particular learning environment, there are two kinds of things we are, uh, that were driving us. We were asking, we were wanting kids to learn how our, um, our homelands and waters in the Puget Sound changing and being impacted by climate change and ocean acidification. But the second question I actually think is really important. We are always asking kids, and what should we do? What are our responsibilities? Um, and we don't often, in many learning environments, we don't position kids to be doers and to enact their responsibilities given what is happening in the world. Um, and so I'd like to point that out. It seems simple, but it changes everything in a learning uh, context when we ask kids to deliberate about what should we do. We do this thing that we called, um, uh, that, that's a way of organizing these things. This is an, an, an example from a program that I run. This is not actually the one from ours, but it's so pretty that I like to use it. Um, um, this is a science teacher at the Squamish um, community. She teaches in their tribal school. Um, but part of what we know is that learning environments end up being learning goal driven, not place driven. And this is one way if you map place and think about all the layers that go into what you might learn in a place, um, it helps educators organize what they should be teaching about. Um, and this is just an example of a, of a teacher that reoriented all of her science curriculum um, in order to be place specific um, and kind of understand the interweaving of kids um, everyday practices, their community practices, their cultural practices, um, as well as kind of the tribe's land management um, and all of the kinds of ecological phenomena going on. Um, and it just is a way to kind of reorient it. So we always do that. I'm happy to answer more questions about that at some point, but I wanted to show that. Um, and then I'm realizing I'm gonna run out of time. So here's a couple of things that I wanna say. In our learning environments, we always focus on story. Um, and I'm gonna show you one kind of quick clip about this, um, that we always start with story. And this particular clip that I'm going to show you um, is uh, starts with a story about grandmother Cedar, who was lonely. And um, the creator sends her a seedling to keep her uh, to, to keep her happy, to keep her in good relations. Um, and the story is about how grandmother Cedar raises her grandson by protecting her, him in different ways, from the rain, from the sun, from deer, um, in all kinds of different ways. And then the story ends with um, 
grand, the grandson doing the same for her. I say that because I'm going to show you a clip and it's important for you all to see um, what it looks like, in my opinion, for children to have the opportunity to think with indigenous knowledge systems um, and stories in particular. Um, in these learning arcs, we do a whole bunch of things besides stories. We learn about Cedar's relationships um, in ecosystems, the ways that peoples have interacted with Cedar, how Cedar takes care of um, other living things in the environment. Um, but we also end up teaching children a lot about the kinds of challenges that Cedar is facing around changing lands and waters. Um, I told you that. Um, I'm gonna show you a quick example. One of the things that we do is that we're really deliberate about our language. Um, and um, a lot of what we do is around remaking what we call plant relatives. Um, and really thinking about how children are forming relationships between plants and the land and water. Um, and one of the things that we've done is um, all of those teachings come from communities um, and kind of vet all of these things just to say that. Um, but we also think about ways that we show kids agency. Um, and so um, what we, this is from a, what we call plant relative walk smaller groups of kids have developed a relationship and kind of become an expert about one of their plant relatives and their jobs are to teach the rest of the kids in these environments. And I should just say in this particular activity, there's about 45 children that range from first grade to um, 10th grade in these activities. We're deliberate about multi-age groups. Um, age segregation is a colonial tool, not an indigenous pedagogy tool. Um, and so we're really deliberate about trying to work on um, intergenerational and inter-age uh, kinds of learning environments. Um, and just to say these groups are, you know, uh, small. There are groups of three or four kids. And I'm gonna show you a clip of two kids. I should also say that we're really deliberate about how we organize our tools and our learning environments um, so that they're reflective. Um, you might think about like all the kind of taxonomic identification tools that are circulating all over the world where there's a name um, and something like the plant family or animal family that it's in. Um, in our tools of designing with families and communities, um, we have reorganized some of those identification tools um, to be seasonally organized, to understand life cycle, but also to understand relationships. Um, you'll also notice that we incorporate language here. Um, all of these things we didn't decide on our own, just to say that. Um, and one of the things that we know about um, Native kids reasoning is that Native kids are much more likely to take on multiple perspectives than non-Native children. That is, they're more likely to reason from other kids' perspectives or other people's perspectives, as well as um, reasoning and gesturing from the perspectives of plants and more than human animals. Um, and so in our materials, we were developing materials that reflected those patterns of reasoning already. Um, we do this in our observational techniques too. I'll just say what one of the things that kids were doing was learning um, to make observations and to do it in a systems way. Um, and so we were asking them to think about their relationships, but who are their neighbors? We were asking them to think about across space and time. So they're thinking about different seasons. We we're getting them to orient above and below. Um, and again, they're sort of plants with personhood. We're really deliberate about, about making sure that we're not reifying kind of a Western view there. Um, here is sort of what this looked like in this activity. I'm going to show you an analysis and then I'm going to actually probably stop because I plan too much. Um, so this is kind of the path of activity. Kids were broken up along in these circles. Um, and I'm going to show you um, uh, two, two groups trying to interact with each other. And just to say, it might be a little bit hard to hear. I'll show you transcript right after this. So the... Um, the when the leaves of the maple tree die, they fall on the ground and they compost. And that's really good soil for the rest of the plants. And over towards here, there's sprout rings. I'm not really sure what plant, but there's some that I do. It's running around. Um, um, yeah, are you going to keep so fast? Um, also, not having the building. They have like the grandma cedar tree, they kind of shield the other plant. This is good. Why do they grow in such uh, non straight ways? What? Um, 
I believe that's a way that that's kind of, they're trying to help out other plants by um, moving around, um, having the trunk move around, so it will cover more areas. Uh, it could also, also be because they need more sun. Yeah, it's also, yeah, they need more sun. They spread okay. out so that they can get more sun. And they take it from the And so that means, also, since, since they um, shield it off, they, when the leaves drop, it gives them. And also, um, that the low trees don't burn up and they also don't drown in water. So, so here's what I want to say about this. Um, there's a lot going on here. And um, part of what I do as a learning scientist, as an educator, is that I teach teachers to pay attention very carefully to how kids are engaging in sense making. And part of what is remarkable about what's happening here is that there is a lot of different layers of sense making happening. And that these young people, um, there's only one question by a teacher, the rest are all kids, um, making sense of how ecosystems work and utilizing, if you'll notice, the grandma cedar tree to understand the kind of ecosystems interactions between mature trees and soil health as well as new growth um, and doing it in ways that they may not be using, um, well, sometimes science education will say, but they're not using scientific terminology and quite frankly, I don't really care um, that they are showing kind of the beginnings of really um, sophisticated understandings of ecosystems, um, and that young girl is nine. She's also presenting to older kids. But the other thing to note about this um, is that the teacher does ask a, a pretty standard kind of Western science question. It's a structure, a structure function behavior question. Um, and the older kids know the schooled answer because more leaves equals more trunks equals more leaves. Uh, so it's more trunks equals more leaves equals photosynthesis. So they know that there's one answer, but they also are navigating to answer it in this way that is framed by these stories and by the kinds of frameworks that they're getting from community. Um, and part of why I wanna say that is that um, part of what we're after is learning environments that enable and utilize um, and help actually support kids being able to do that in multiple ways. The other thing that I guess, I got, I guess I'll just say um, is there's a whole series of things here. We can see plant agency reasoning. Um, in fact, the younger girl, Yuna says, I, she answers because she thinks that the tree is trying to help other plants. Um, and so we see um, a kind of continuation of something around understanding and reasoning with plant agency in a way that we wanted to in this learning environment. Um, I know that I'm, I'm almost over time. So um, what I, I, I guess what I wanna um, end kind of with is, um, is saying to you all um, that part of what um, I think is really important is that sometimes when we um, think about indigenous knowledges is that we end up in a place that doesn't understand it in the daily, everyday kinds of ways. Um, and for when we think about children's reasoning, um, it's not appropriate to ask a nine-year-old to be able to reason like an elder yet, right? That's a form of expertise. And oftentimes what happens in learning environments is the demand on young people is an inappropriate demand. Um, and so for me, part of what I'm after is being able to understand is what do healthy learning environments look like that can cultivate and encourage indigenous children being able to reason um, and develop expertise in our own culture and ways of knowing and navigate into Western sciences in a way that doesn't continue what some people have called epistemic harm or that does damage to our own ways of knowing. And in that particular case, I would argue that that's a pretty healthful way um, for Native kids to be moving back and forth. Um, I want to end by just saying that hopefully I've shown you like a range and I know that there's a lot going from kind of standing rock and colonial constructions to being able to see everyday reasoning. But I've done that on purpose to say that the layers of questions we should be asking is what is made possible for learners in those interactions and in moments of teaching and learning. And I think I'll stop. Megan, thank you so much. We do have a lot of chatter on the chat room, in the chat room and the questions. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Um, yeah. We have a few minutes here. And um, if we go all the way back, um, one of your slides was talking about the teacher elder bar graph. And can you explain the natural kind? Somebody asked that what that meant. 
Yeah, it's a technical term for saying water, wind, sun. Um, it, that's what I mean by that. Is so uh, what what Western biology wouldn't say is a living kind. In most native languages, things like rocks are animate. Um, yeah. Sun is animate. Uh, wind is animate. And so that's what I mean. Those natural kinds is kind of this category. So. And we've had a lot of uh, questions about resources, which we will talk about after this webinar. We'll share some things. Megan has agreed to that we could work with one of her grad students to share some additional resources. And we will share all the sharings that's been going on in the chat room because some of you had some really great um, resource ideas. Another question, Megan. Um, it seems to me that indigenous education relies heavily on placemaking, which is very tailored to the local. How might you teach about global issues through an indigenous perspective? Yeah, for, um, for me, um, I, I think that we can, uh, one of the juxtapositions, um, global is made up of lots of locals. Um, and while there are other ways to think about global, part of what um, we know is that there are indigenous peoples all over the globe um, and that there are many ways to understand the relationships between potentially large global flows and their instantiations in local environments and local communities. Um, and so I think being able to make visible indigenous people globally is really important. So for example, I know that there's a lot of organizing going on in Asia right now um, for recognition of, of indigenous people pre the creation of the nation state in places like Thailand. Um, mm -hmm for example. And so I do think that there are ways to do that. And part of, I think, the fundamental question is to always ask about the presence of Indigenous peoples um, and, and, and how and why might we assume that there are not Indigenous peoples. Greenland is the same thing. Iceland is the same thing. Um, and, and, I, and so I think that that's one thing. I'll also say this. I, I don't think it's... Um, I, I think that all kids should also learn about nation states and global. Um, and I think that sometimes we position things as either or, and I, I think that's a false decision. Mm -hmm. um, so just to say that too. That was great. And that uh, global is made up of lots of locals. Um, uh, Catherine had a similar question, but not exactly. A lot of the folks on, on this webinar do teach adults and anything about adult education that you can share in like just a few minutes of kind of your thinking on it, reaching adults. Uh, yeah, Similar. so my first thing is that I think everyone should read Native Science and Braiding Sweetgrass and A Yupiak Way of Knowing. So everybody should read those books. Um, and part of the reason I say that is because I think adults, um, I think adults bring kind of settler fragility and fear as soon as they start down this road. Um, and I think those books are such loving gifts to the world about what else is possible. Um, and then I also think that what needs to happen is it's, I really think decolonization is not a metaphor, it's a really important read. Um, because I think one of the things that really has to happen is uh, oftentimes when we think about these things, people don't realize they're participating currently in the ongoing colonialism and erasure of native people. And people need ways to make sense of that and kind of figure out how are you going to live in those contradictions and also try to make change. So I, I, that is one thing I would say. Um, the other thing I would say is that people need to be willing to um, hear the layers and years of um, trauma and um, oppression that has come. And I often think that sometimes I get the like, uh, a little bit of fragility that comes with having to actually make sense of the ongoing kind of work that we've all been doing. And so I would encourage people to be generous um, when you, you might um, experience uh, different emotional responses to efforts to change um, and, and realize that it's a, it's a long-term game that we're after. Thank you, Megan. Um, this is fantastic. And we do have um, a number of other, hold on just for a minute. Whoops, that's not what we want to share. Um, we have a number of other questions that we can talk about um, afterward. I really want to thank you for this wonderful presentation and just helping us understand more about your thoughts on how we design, as you said, with for dimensions of race, culture, and power and being thoughtful about what we're doing, and most importantly for all of us to do our homework. 
and use stories and think about all that you told us in a very short amount of time. So thank you for all the research you're doing. We really appreciate that. And I really um, encourage everyone to look at some of the resources. We will share those with everyone. Um, a lot did come through the chat and we will have more in the future. You'll be able to find this webinar recorded on EE Pro, and you are welcome to share with your colleagues. We know that a lot of people wanted to be on this and couldn't, but wanted to listen to the webinar. And Megan, thank you for agreeing to be able to share your slides with everyone. And we also hope that you'll subscribe to NAA's YouTube channel where you can see all the past webinars and be able to get updates when we add things to the YouTube channel. So thank you all so much. There will be updates in the future about upcoming webinars. Um, we will be doing a webinar in early September with John Folk on how to give an engaging uh, presentation as we lead into Lexington. Registration is open for the, con uh, for the conference. And as somebody on the chat said, we hope to see many of you in Lexington, Kentucky. Megan, thank you so much. Any final words for all of us that you want to leave us with before we end? Uh, <laughs> I know that's, no, that's, such a, that's a hard thing. Um, I want to also I'll just say this. Thank you for coming and listening. And I and I hope that I've made uh, if nothing else, I hope everyone will continue to share. I'm just scrolling right now. Um, what great resources. Some of my heroes have been listed multiple times. I see that I was not the first one to recommend Braiding Sweetgrass or, or Greg Cajete. So, you know, I would just encourage everyone to keep trying to form relations and being deeply reflective and kind of open to understanding the long processes um, that we're part of and that we have um, agency to shift and change. And we kind of all need it. So, Jimmy Gwetch. Thank you all so much, Megan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we will share all of this. And thanks to Kristen and Colby for making sure everything worked and for helping to track all of this. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great um, week. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right, take care.